Right, so moving on for the first panel, ladies and gentlemen. The first panel is on Singapore's ethnic identities, an evolving dynamic. Please welcome the moderator for the panel, Madam Rahayu Mazam, Management Committee Member of OnePeople.sg and Member of Parliament for Jurong GRC. She will introduce the panel and speakers. Madam Rahayu, please. Good morning, distinguished guests. It brings me great pleasure and honour to introduce the panel of speakers who will be kicking off the discussion this morning. So firstly, allow me to introduce Associate Professor uh, Eugene Tan, who is the Associate Professor of Law at the School of Law, Singapore Management University, where he teaches courses at the Law, Business and Social Sciences schools at the undergraduate, graduate and executive education levels. He also teaches a course on ethics and social responsibility at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. He has also taught as a visiting professor at the Yonsei University Law School in Seoul, South Korea. Associate Professor Tan's interdisciplinary research interests include constitutional and administrative law, law and public policy, the government and politics of Singapore, and the ethical and policy framework on artificial intelligence. He's published book chapters, journal articles, and op-eds on ethnic relations in Singapore, and is completing a book manuscript on the management of ethnic relations in Singapore. An advocate and solicitor of the Supreme Court of Singapore, Associate Professor Tan was educated in the National University of Singapore, London School of Economics and Political Science, and Stanford University, where he was a Fulbright Fellow. Between February 2012 and August 2014, Associate Professor Tan served as a nominated Member of Parliament in Singapore's 12th Parliament. Secondly, I'm also very happy to introduce Dr. Alexis Pereira, who is currently the President of the Eurasian Association Singapore. He had previously served as Chair of the Eurasian Association's Education Subcommittee, as well as Vice President. Previously, Dr. Pereira was a lecturer at the Department of Sociology, National University of Singapore. He received his PhD in 2001 from the London School of Economics and Political Sciences. Dr. Pereira has had a long-standing interest researching the Eurasian community. He has published Eurasians as part of the Singapore Chronicles series 2015 and was a co-editor of Singapore Eurasians 2015. I'm also very happy to introduce, lastly, um, but of course not least important, Mr. Zainal Abidin Rashid, um, Ambassador Zainal, is Singapore's non-resident ambassador to Kuwait and Special Envoy to the Middle East, a corporate advisor to Tomasi International Limited, and he sits on the board of trustees of Nanyang Technological University. He was a former Senior Minister of State for Foreign Affairs and Member of Parliament from 1997 to 2011. He has also held various prominent positions in media and community institutions, including being editor of Brita Haryan from 1976 to 1996, president of Majlis Islam Singapura, MUIS, 1991 to 1996, CEO of Mandaki, 1990 to 1986, as well as chairman of the Malay Heritage Foundation, 2003 to 2010. He graduated from the University of Singapore, now sorry, University of Singapore, now the National University of Singapore, with BA Honours in Economics and Malay Studies. So without further ado, I am very happy to introduce, uh, to uh, invite them on stage. Each uh, panel members will be given 15 minutes to speak first and present, after which we will then come together for the question and answer. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, I want to thank um, IPS and one people.sg for this opportunity to share my views. Um, so first, let me begin by um, telling you, you know, this provocative title. Um, I, when I look at the, the ethnic survey, uh, the survey that was done, uh, um, and the findings of which were released um, last year and which Dr. Matthews went through, uh, I wondered whether we, we are increasingly, uh, as a society, beginning to look at our belly buttons. And by that I mean, you know, the, the, the greater concern about where we come from, who we are, uh, in, in very, um, very ethnic terms. And survey after survey also shows that we have been um, doing fairly well, uh, you know, in terms of uh, inter-ethnic relations. And so I wonder whether there's also a sense that we, we might be sleepwalking, um, you know, uh, thinking that we have arrived when actually we still have many issues that, that we still need to, to grapple with. Um, 
all multiracial societies face the collective um, action challenge. Right? So the question is, you know, how, how do you deal with diversity so that the differences do not become a source of friction, discord, and, and division? Right? And of course, the challenge then is, um, what can so such societies do uh, you know, to encourage uh, you know, genuine and substantial harmonious relations? Uh, and also, you know, considering that there will always be forces that will seek to divide you know, for such societies to come out uh, re uh, resiliently. So, as, as Dr. Matthews pointed out, you know, um, the, the state of multi-ethnicity in Singapore is generally positive overall. Uh, what is really helpful, of course, is that um, we have, in a way, embraced this notion of multiple identities. Right? So, being Singaporean doesn't exclude us from uh, being a Muslim you know, or a Christian, uh, or a Chinese, or a Malay, or Indian, right? So the, so the notion is that we all have various identities, and, and they are compatible, uh, you know, with each other. Um, the, the survey doesn't say this, you know, but, but of course, when we think about how we have arrived, I think one, one could say, you know, that, that there has been that very strong management, um, you know, with regards to the, what I call the ethnic markers of race, language, and religion, right? So we can think about the various laws that are in place, and, and how the, the, the government policy is always, you know, to, to engage in preemptive strikes, you know, if I can put it that way. Uh, but the survey also shows that ethnic identities are still very strong, um, you know, but I think that shouldn't surprise us, right, because when you are a very diverse society, uh, you become more conscious of who you are, how different you might be from, from, from the others. Right, so this idea, this notion that uh, there is stronger attachment to one's ethnic identity uh, is not at all surprising. Um, and, and for the majority, right, you know, the, the fact that they seem less interested, the Chinese seem less interested in the other cultures, the other faith, the other religions, may not be so surprising, right? Because when you are a very dominant majority, three quarters, uh, you know, the need to reach out might be seen to be less, uh, less important. Um, and the survey also raises uh, this particular term of, you know, Chinese privilege, which I'm rather uncomfortable with, um, not because I'm Chinese. Um, well, sorry, let me, let me, let me, I'm classified Chinese, right, you know, but, but, but um, that's because of my father, right? My mother is Eurasian, and, and, and so, you know, but the, 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 I think the difficulty with the, the term Chinese privilege is, um, I think different, many people have different connotations, but I think the idea is that uh, the minorities see that uh, the Chinese may have certain benefits or advantages over the other. Um, and, and, and of course, you know, th there is this conflation, uh, which sometimes can be problematic uh, for the Malay communities, conflation of race um, and religion, right? So one, one, one indicator was raised by Dr. Matthews, for example, was wearing the tudong, you know, could be seen as a, a racial or cultural thing when it's perhaps more religious than anything else. Um, so again, no difference that uh, ethnic markers matter more uh, to the non-Chinese. Um, right? I think when you're a minority, I think you, you tend to uh, be more conscious of these things. But, but I also want to flag you know, this concern of mine, you know, whether there might be centrifugal forces uh, in motion, uh, because I think the survey, you know, while, while not uh, strongly, in, uh, strongly uh, determinative, does indicate that uh, there is stronger ethnic consciousness, with, with that tinge of exclusivity. Um, and mother tongue uh, is something which is uh, almost defining uh, of one's uh, ethnic identity. Um, you know, so for me, you know, I've always had difficulty with uh, Chinese being described as my mother tongue. Right? It is my father tongue, no, not, not my mother tongue. But, but, but then the idea that, you know, if you are if you're a Malay, you should be able to speak Malay. If you're Chinese, you should be able to speak Chinese. I think, uh, you know, that, that, that is something that we should keep watch on. And then we come to immigration, right? The survey also uh, pointed out that, um, you know, that someone is more like, a new citizen is more likely to be accepted, uh, you know, as Singaporean, you know, if he or she comes from the Chinese, Malay, uh, Indian communities. Um, you know, so if you're African or Arab, uh, you know, or, or Middle Eastern, uh, you know, then there's life you know, the idea that you could be part of the Singaporean community is, 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 not, um, is not that so well accepted, right? So, so 
I, I wonder whether you know the, the overall survey of, of uh, you know points to um, you know that even as we are more we are comfortable with our multiple identities, we are also increasingly less attuned uh, you know to the multi-racial ethos you know that has made Singapore uh, what it is today, uh, and that there might be this, this increasing resort uh, you know to parochial identities. So let me just quickly go, go through the, the, the key arguments that I have. Right? There are three. Right? So one is, I think certainly there is no doubt that the various policies that have been mentioned have maintained the importance of ethnic identity to Singaporeans, right? um, because they do promote uh, you know, ethnic or, or racial consciousness. Um, my second argument is you know, that while ethnic consciousness is, is, is important and useful because it helps us uh, it helps root, uh, tells us who we are and all. The question is, you know, if, if there is excessive ethnic consciousness, uh, then that could stifle the nation-building process. Um, and, and I think ultimately, you know, it is important for us to, even as we seek to promote and, 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 and strengthen, you know, ethnic identities, we must remember that it is important to, to build that overarching civic identity and loyalty. Right? So the whole notion of being a Singapore, a Singaporean, a Singapore citizen. Citizenship is important because I, I see it as you know, the platform by which we can mold common identity and values from the diversity that is Singapore. Um, so civic citizenship, uh, you know, to me, is the most, uh, the most apt non-majoritarian constitutional arrangement. Right, so anyone who subscribes to our values of multiracialism, meritocracy, incorruptibility, for example, um, these are the values that would bind you know, the different uh, groups. Um, and so we shed that, that, civic, that the ethnic identity and embrace uh, this larger identity. Citizenship in Singapore, of course, you know, also means that uh, the, the, the different groups do not forfeit a collective claim uh, and recognition of their own distinctive identities. Uh, I think that's important. I think you know, we can never take away the fact that you know, we're Chinese, Malay, Indian, or others. Uh, and so for me, you know, I, I think even as we seek to promote you know, the different cultures and all, you know, we mustn't lose sight of the importance of this overarching uh, common civic identity. Um, you know, so in Singapore, you know, we often talk about um, you know, the racial or the hyphenated Singaporean, right? Chinese, Singaporean, Malay, Singaporean, and all. And so I wonder whether, I just want to pose this question, you know, uh, for you to think about, you know, uh, have we, in, in that process, you know, forgotten about the Singaporean uh, Singapore, right? That, that sometimes when we gaze too much at our belly, you know, we forget that there is a larger world um, out there. Um, and, and so, you know, when we look at the, the survey, for example, um, you know, th there is this disconnect between the ideal and reality of experiencing uh, one's ethnic cultures other than one's own. Um, the, the, the survey, you know, shows that, well, everyone recognises, you know, the, the, the ideal, you know, of experiencing other cultures, but when, when asked whether they have engaged in it, the numbers are, are, are lower. Uh, and, and, of course, food is something which is very much, you know, in, in, in the Singaporean DNA, uh, but also, while it's helpful, I also wonder whether, you know, in consuming food cultures, right, whether that's, in a way, also transient, and, and sometimes whether we're also exoticizing, making, you know, the different cultures exotic. Um, and the survey findings also show that, that you know, there is, uh, among younger Singaporeans, 21 to 25 years of age, you know, uh, 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 they, they, they demonstrate lower levels of uh, intercultural understanding. So to me, these are some of the issues that we should... Uh, we should bear in mind, right? You know, so um, this, this, this is a quote that I've taken from the survey findings. Um, it, you know, quite, quite surprising, right? You know, th to see that the young people have grown up in, in a multiracial environment, um, you, know, you know, perceive the ethnic markers to be very important as well as rank high in terms of ethnic pride. The CMIO has been blamed very often, um, you know, but, I, but I'm not so sure that in the end that, that's the right uh, person to blame, uh, if anyone can be blamed at all. But one thing we should bear in mind is that the CMIO classification has both a homogenizing and heterogenizing effect. Homogenizing in the sense that it removes the differences between uh, the different subgroups within the Chinese community. Right? So as a boy growing, as a young boy in, in the 70s, you know, 
people who identify as Hokkien, Cantonese, Teochew, and Hakka, and all that, uh, that is a lot less now. Right? You, you ask the, the young people today, they'll, they'll say they are Chinese. Right? So it, it does homogenize uh, you know, the, uh, within the groups within each race, and it happens, that happens with the Malay and Indian communities as well. But it's also heterogenizing because it's, it in a way reinforces uh, interracial uh, differences. But co- there have been constant calls right, for CMIO to be removed. Um, I, I'm not sure in the end that's going to make a significant difference right? because uh, you know, if we take away CMIO classification tomorrow, will that make us all less Chinese, less Malay, less Indian? I'm not so sure. But I think the CMIO classification has a, a, a certain importance. Right? It, it, it demonstrates, for me at least, you know, that th- this country recognizes you know, that there are different races. So to me, I think there is that, that, that salutary effect. Um, but we're also seeing more uh, inter-ethnic marriages, international marriages, and so the question of you know, how, how robust you know, the CMO classification is, uh, is something that, that, that should be kept in mind. What these various policies demonstrate um, you know, is that in Singapore, uh, you know, there is this conscious effort to try to be race blind. We have to, right, because of our inherent uh, diversity. But our policies have also been clearly very conscious about race. Um, you know, so, so, um, so whether you look at CMIO, whether you look at the special position the Malays has provided for in the Singapore Constitution, uh, national service deployment, less so today, mother tongue, ethnic self-help framework, ethnic integration policy, GRC, and the reserve presidential election, all these are, are manifestations of this idea of being race conscious uh, you know, in the, on the journey you know, towards being race blind. But for me, the, the, the key point is, you know, how do we make use of these policies matter a lot more uh, you know, than, than whether we use them? And I think it's useful you know, after 50 years, more than 50 years, you know, to consider whether policies that worked well in the past, uh, whether they can be tweaked, whether they can be improved, um, you know, so that uh, you know, these policies do not uh, you know, unwittingly promote uh, you know, racial exclusiveness as well as ethnocentrism. Uh, and we should always bear in mind, you know, that there is certain, certain path dependence, right? When we talk about policy, policy decisions that made in the past have a strong influence on, on, on current behavior. So let me talk about, very quickly, because my time is almost up, on the pillars of multiracialism. Uh, you know, we have that founding constitutional moment, right? Uh, that, that quote that uh, Minister Iswaran uh, mentioned earlier. I, I, I will co- I'll come back to that. Um, another pillar, of course, is the, is the fact that multiple identities are recognized as well as supported. Um, and we have, you know, uh, talk about, you know, the whole notion of why we became independent, uh, you know, points to the imperative, right, of being, of the, this overarching identity, uh, which must be our primary identity as well as our primary loyalty. Um, and another pillar is, you know, the, the, the constant effort, right, you know, to, to ensure uh, adequate minority representation in key institutions. Um, so, when we look at multiracialism in Singapore, you know, I think trust is, is, is crucial, right? And, and my concern with the increasing uh, ethnic consciousness is whether racial identity and belonging, instead of being a shield, right, would be used as a sword, meaning, you know, this is what my race wants, this is what we should do, uh, you know, there should be that, uh, we should start counting numbers or be equal and, and, and all that. Um, one challenge for Singapore, right, you know, is that we must, in our policies, try to develop what I call cross-cutting cleavages and, and a common identity. Right? So if you look at Singapore, you know, on, on the markers of race, language, and religion, these differences tend to reinforce right, rather than to negate um, e- each other. Uh, my time is up, so I, I, I really need to run through. I'm almost done. Um, the survey doesn't, doesn't point to this, um, you know, but I think we need to also bear in mind external influences. Um, you know, which will impact upon uh, Singapore as well. So one is, of course, you know, the, the, the rise of uh, identity politics globally as well as regionally, um, and the rise of you know, Singapore's, uh, the, the, home, the ancestral homelands of Singaporeans and how they could impact on, on, on diasporas. Um, you know, they, they, may not, um, they, they may or may not work in our favour, but it's something that, that we should uh, bear in mind. So let me just conclude uh, very quickly. Uh, when we talk about, you know, in, in opening words of, of the National pl- Pledge, uh, 
The question is, who are we? I, I don't think it's a question that we often ask ourselves enough. Um, and I wonder whether you know, the survey you know, could point to very early signs you know, that we may not appreciate uh, enough you know, how we are enriched by the presence as well as the success of others who are ethnically different from us but are fellow citizens. Um, I'd like to go back to the founding moment, right? Because this was the whole genesis of, of Singapore. Uh, and, and, and this is why I, 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 I put on the slide this whole notion that we were created on the aspiration of an expanding concept of we. Right? We didn't want a Malay Mal Malaysia, right? we wanted a Malaysian Malaysia. And, and when that didn't work out, we fought for, uh, we broke away and then, you know, uh, and so we should talk about, you know, the Singaporean Singapore. Um, can we continue to ensure right, you know, that this notion of the we right, is all-embracing, all-inclusive, rather than one you know, that becomes contracting uh, and, and, and fearful? Right? So this is a founding constitutional moment that I talk about that Minister as Warren raised. I think it's something that we should um, you know, always bear in mind. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, friends. Um, I was wondering whether really or not to thank you for inviting me. Because uh, um, when Matthews asked me to speak, Matthews and me go back a long way, okay? I examine your thesis. Huh? When we go back a long way and he asked me to speak, I said, Hey, Matthews, can I be the devil's advocate? No. Cannot lah. Maybe got minister, got MP, got professors. Okay, I cannot be the devil's advocate. I can be the devil. I didn't check this part with him. And you know, this is why, because I used to be called the devil so many times, especially by my teacher, back, way back in school. Um, you're the devil. It's usually after I do this. Every, you know, last time we don't have electronic forms, so we had to fill up forms by paper, right? Every time I had to fill up my race, I would write human. Anyway, that has a little bit to do with what I'm going to talk about today. Because I haven't been in university for like a long time, so I'm not going to speak about anything academic. It would really be my reflections about this CMIO thing, right? Take a look at this picture. This is a social reality. You see this at the Kopitiam in class? No. This is a posed picture. Especially, you know, holding the flag. Uh, it's around National Day. Uh, yeah. but, but, there's a point behind this. Because this, you know, CMIO, some people say it's very artificial. Really, it's about recognition and representation. All right? I'm going to talk a little bit about that and then discuss some consequences of recognition. I mean, why does the government do this? July and August. July is racial harmony month, right? August is national day. Why do they... It is not the first national day photo which you will see like that. Because recognition is crucial to racial harmony. Right? As uh, Eugene mentioned just now, the state recognises the existence of these races. Like this. It is directly related to keeping the peace, cohesion, harmony, to show that each race is not forgotten. And, and, uh, and, and recognition has a lot of... Uh, Usefulness, as, as Eugene mentioned just now, his, his long list, which he didn't get to cover, I also won't cover it, but to recognise that you exist means we have space for you, we will set aside plots for your mosque, temple, church, so on and so forth. We recognise you exist. Okay? I'm not going to belabor the point, I think we all know this part, but here's where it's going to get fun. right? I'm going to show you some consequences of recognition, especially coming from minority race. Okay? So the first consequence um, of recognition, especially for us, 
others is not a race. Think about it. By the way, this is a book written by Melissa De Silva. Okay. Um, she uses this as a provocative starting point. Uh, I'm, helping, I'm, I'm not really helping her promote the book, but it's a good book, yeah? so it's available at all national bookstores. You can <laughs> go and find out, or if you can't get a copy, let me know. But what's the point here? The point here is that actually, like Eugene says, right, it reminds us, especially us, the Eurasians, and those others who are in the others category, that you're the other. The second concept... Okay, so, wait, wait. Forgot the point. The point is that it reminds us that we are the minority. Okay, it reminds us that we're the minority. Okay, the next point I want to come to is... Actually, yeah, having set up the system of the state is going to recognize you, now the communities themselves expect to be recognized. I'll give you two sec I'll give you a minute. What's wrong with this picture? What's wrong? I, I don't know if you can you see it. A little bit blur, taken from my handphone. Last year at the One People 10th Anniversary Celebration. What's wrong with this picture? My vice president over there, she's very good at this. Why no Eurasian? I got a kompang, the Chinese drums, and the North Indian drums, right? Where are the Eurasians? Ramesh, where are the Eurasians? Ramesh says, hey, we checked now, you all don't have a percussion on some, you know. <laughs> oh. Okay, okay, back off. We back off. <laughs> we back off. Afterwards, uh, she will go outside, check the lunch. Got devil curry or not? <laughs> no devil curry! Sorry, uh, some of you may not have had breakfast, so let's quickly move on. Um, I, I, was, I was wondering whether or not to proceed with this part here. I'm going to talk about... Uh, Reserve presidency. Yeah? Some minister left, then another one walked in. Okay, so, Mom, if you don't see me again, huh, I love you. <laughs> okay, so what is this? What, what's this got to do with what I'm saying? Okay, so now uh, we reach to me, to me, I'm speaking very personally. Okay, okay, I well, forgot one other disclaimer. I do not represent the Eurasian Association for this last next, next five minutes. Okay. <laughs> But reserve election for races. Why? Must recognize the minorities. Hey, no need, no need. PM, no need, no need. Really, we're fine. No, must recognize you. Must recognize you. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Totally hypocritical because I'm one of the signatories behind this uh, reserve election thing as well. Must recognize you. So, so this has consequences, you know. This has consequences because very much like the very first picture, I have been a victim of find me one Eurasian. You know, at certain events, they need a photograph. Hey, find me one Eurasian. And then they drag me out there. Then the photographer says, he don't look Eurasian. Huh? Can get another one or not? <laughs> and then that was the state trying to, trying to, I don't know, it's like overcompensate or really go all out to recognize us. But this has, to me, filtered down to everyone as well. Everyone wants to recognize everyone as well. So, um, I get this all the time. Hey, excuse me, uh, are you a Singaporean? Uh, uh Yes. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. You know when this happens the most? This happens the most when I take Grab. Why? Not taxi, Grab. Why? Because the Grab driver can see my name. <laughs> because it's on the booking, right? I mean, so, okay. So he sees my name. And then he's looking, where, where, I don't see a Eurasian. No? Oh, oh, you are, okay. Get in and then... If it's me and the wife, right, we already have this running game. If, is he going to ask one of the three questions? 
Uh, are you a relation? Why your name so funny? Huh? Sorry, there was only two. <laughs> My next point is really, you know, guess what? I'm at the end. I'm at the end. The point here is that, yeah, recognition functionally serves its purpose. Without this, things might be worse. But with it and going overboard can have a lot of consequences. So, so one of the things that we have to remind ourselves, we are Singaporeans and we have to exist, is that you don't have to always recognize us. We're fine, you know? We're fine. Sometimes this recognition can come across as what they call microaggression. If I start speaking in Mandarin, they say, wow, your Chinese is very good, huh? Okay? This is microaggression. Sometimes it's unintended. Okay? And, and, and it has an effect because you, you're placing a lot of pressure on us to be of a certain thing. And it and, and it might possibly sound condescending. Is this necessary? Just be aware of it, right? Because this is what we feel regularly. But this, the last thing, really, this is the last slide. The last thing I want to say is that for those of us, especially in the minorities, we must learn not to be so easily offended, lah, not so triggered all the time. Yes. There are racists and bigots out there. But the majority of people who constantly ask me about my name, my background, and my history, and who you people are, have no malice or evil behind it. They're just curious. And sometimes when they don't understand who we are, they forgot, oh, you got, got such thing as Eurasians. Uh. Oh, but Eurasian, yes, but uh, Singaporean Samoa, God, uh. Is that, why do you constantly wear the Portugal jersey? I mean, you know, they don't understand what I do, right? So they're like, I have now learned not to get easily offended. I, I, I take one second, because you know, that's, that's the maximum of my, time, my, my, my mind space, and I ask myself, Did these people being evil or not? No. Pure curiosity. And sometimes they get it wrong. You know, you know how... You know how often I get called Mr. Anthony? Honestly, today, reached this past the half century, you know, last time I used to get so triggered, you know, this, the Lucifer morning star in me will come out. But, but today, I'm like, call me Mr. Anthony. It's better than you mangling my surname. I'm fine with that now, okay? I don't get upset. It's okay. It's okay. Let's stress on you. So come back to... Yeah, I know. <laughs> come back to the last point, right? So CMIO, whether we like it or not, is going to be here. We should try and live better with it. And, and uh, just a hint to political office holders and and uh, civil servants here, civil servants there. <laughs> Don't overdo this recognition thing. We're fine. We're fine. Okay, so, so that's one. Two, uh, again, to my civil service friends over there. Don't get so triggered. Every small thing get worried, you know. Um, like any small incident, well, there could be a racial riot tomorrow. No, 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 no. And the last thing for the everyday people like us, right? Um, having the, those of us, I'm, I'm talking about those of us who, who you, like me, used to get triggered, uh, very, get really upset. You, you just misunderstand my name, mispronounce my name. Like I know some of my Malay friends, they do get upset because they could be called Mr., you know, Hey, that's not that's my father's name because they, you know they, 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 some people don't know the order and then they get like so upset. I'm like, okay, but 60 years ago, the racists were killing each other on the street. 
Today, this is the source of your upsetness. Relax. Relax. So, um, I didn't have much else to say. I just wanted to say that peace. Thank you. Uh, I was so amused by Anthony that I didn't even want. <laughs> uh, sorry, prayer. <laughs> well, um, Tacha Hao, wanna come? And Apakaba, Damakam Bloom? Oh, I'm, I'm surprised you replied. Because that Apakaba Damakan Bloom is a very Chinese expression. Because Chinese, when they are immigrants, they came to this part of the world, they are all hungry all the time. <laughs> so they always ask, first thing they ask is, Chap, uh, boy. <laughs> whether you have eaten or not. For the Malays, in fact, eating is not that important. But God is. So they always start with, Salam Alaikum. Prayer, peace. <laughs> well, um, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, you know, um, you're lucky that I'm not singing a Hokkien song, song today. <laughs> you want me to sing IPR, is it? <laughs> well, that reminds me of actually last October, I was in Shanghai. I know this is IPS uh, NUS event, but I'm also serving on the NTU Board of Trustees. So I was in Shanghai last October for the convocation, and guess what? When I saw the event, it was very Chinese, but the person representing the NTU, the pro-chancellor, was my good friend, Mr. Osman Harun Yusuf. And next to me, another BOT member was Mr. Indajit Singh. And the three of us are representing NTU in Shanghai for a convocation. So you can imagine how out of place we felt. But I, I rose to the challenge and I called on Mr. Osman Harun Yusuf and Indajit Singh to join me on stage and to sing Aipia, Aichiaia. <laughs> and to add to that, I sang Peng Yo in Mandarin. But can you imagine if three of us had gone up stage and sang Chan Mali Chan? <laughs> or what is the Tamil song we learn in school? <laughs> Monera. <laughs> Would the audience appreciate it? But they love our Aipia and Peng Yo, so much so that, in fact, the three of us are invited to come back to Shanghai this October. <laughs> But that's our Singapore. What I saw in us being Singaporean, three of us, Malays, Indian, singing Chinese songs in Shanghai. And what I'd like to share with you today, uh, uh, Brayu, thank you for making me the last speaker, because I think all that's need to be said about definitions, about concerns and challenges have been said by Eugene and uh, Pereira. So what I'll do today, is to share with you some of my grandfather's stories, my life, my life journey, and what it meant in terms of the issue about ethnicity, being Singaporean, and the challenges ahead. Basically, to say that, as, as our guest of honor said, it's work in progress, it's evolving, but with dynamics that are changing from period to period from year to year. And it involves not only about internalizing our own beliefs, our own perceptions of what nationalism is about, what being Singaporean is about, what being ethnic or ethnicity is about, but also what's happening in the geographical sphere, our neighbors. I think we all know what's happening in Malaysia now. The issues of race, the issues of Malaysian Malaysia, which I think one of the reasons why Singapore was uh, asked to leave Malaysia. And what's happening in Indonesia? Some of you may have seen this video, took the youngest minister in Malaysia, Sadiq Khan, 
interviewing Jokowi and he ended up by saying, we are Surumpun. We belong to the same ethnic group. What it all means to all of us in terms of these issues. So, you know, whenever I talk about my old grandfather's stories, some of my younger friends tell me, yeah, please, lah, you know, we are all Singaporeans now. You know? Please stop talking about your grandfather's stories. But I can't help it. I think one of the reasons why Matthew and friends invited me is because of my grandfather's stories. <laughs> I'm 70 years old. If you go by the definition about uh, 30 years per generation, we are about two generations past our independence. How long more do you want to wait before we talk about being Singaporean without having to refer to your ethnic background? It took 200 years for America to have a black president. We had to change our constitution to ensure that there is adequate minority representation in our EP. After what, 40 over years from the first president, Yusuf Ishak. That itself became a controversy. Not only because, as I think Pereira mentioned, whether we need a Eurasian or an Indian or Malay to be a president from time to time, but also the definition of Malay itself became an issue, became a controversy. Whether one is Malay enough. I've always seen myself as a Malay. I don't speak Tamil. Basically of Malay culture. But am I Malay enough to be accepted by the Malays? I think you, you heard what Rahayu told you just now about I was editor of Brita Haryan for more than 20 years, president of Islamic Religious Council, press, uh, chairman of the Malay Heritage Foundation. But will I be Malay enough if I were a candidate for EP? Will the Malays felt uh, again this whole issue? The Arabs and the Indians are always representing the Malays. So when it comes to race, so even within their own community, there are issues. Just as I think when we talk about new citizens of Singapore, the tensions that we have, we face now about Chinese, Singaporean, and mainland Chinese for that matter, or Hong Kong or Taiwan. I think even more so among Indians. North Indians, Tamil Indians, with the immigrants, uh, with the talent which we import, especially in IT and many professional fields, you do get a lot more non-Tamil speaking Tam uh, Indians who are in Singapore now, creating different kind of tensions. Let me just share with you some of my examples, my own personal life, how in fact I saw these issues evolving. Back in 1964, I was in secondary three, and I was almost killed in the racial riots. It was a Friday. I left school early to go to the mosque. I, the details are important too because Malay, Muslim, we left school early. We didn't realize curfew had been called. Racial riots had broken out. And, um, but I was caught near Kalang Gaswak at Victoria Street. And there I saw pandemonium and people were just killing senselessly just because you have a different color of the skin. Whether you are Malay or you are Indian is relevant. The Chinese boys and teenagers and, and workers at that uh, Scottish industries in that area were just going berserk and killing innocent people whom they don't know. What kind of impact would it have on a, tree, a secondary three-year-old boy. What does it mean in terms of being Singaporean? And we must, we must remember that in those days, we were still struggling with the concept of Singapore in Malaysia. We want to be part of Malaysia, yes, but does Malaysia want us to be part of Malaysia because of our 75% Chinese upsetting the balance of race in Malaysia? 
How do the Malays feel in Singapore? They were once indigenous majority, became a minority because of immigration, but they saw themselves saving Singapore by the referendum, because of the referendum, because the Chinese were divided between the Barisan supporters and the PAP supporters, and the Malay votes and the Indian votes that made the difference for Singapore to be part of that merger, to be part of Malaysia. And, of course, for a price, because, I mean, for, for a reward, because from a minority, then they were converted to become a majority again, the Malays in, in Malaysia. Only to be denied the status of majority again, to be reduced to a minority when Malaysian leaders decided to ask Singapore to leave Malaysia. Imagine all these issues playing on the minds of the Malay minorities. I know from the survey just now shared by, by Matthew with us, we saw quite a number of areas where, in fact, Malays stood very high in terms of their feeling about being ethnic. And that's geography. That's relationship with Malaysia. History, relationship with Indonesia. And we see things replaying all the time. Whether it's Malaysian politics, race politics, which still need to be handled correctly. And Indonesia, we thought, was more stable. But look what after Ahok's case. Singapore was cited as an example. Don't be like Singapore. The Chinese come in a minority first and then suddenly became majority and they dominate the whole situation. They rule the country at the expense of minorities. Indonesians still harping on that kind of language. They were bold enough to have a Chinese to be the governor, uh, to, be the, to be the vice governor you know, of uh, Jakarta, capital of Indonesia. But are they prepared to have a Chinese Indonesian to be president of the largest Muslim country in the world. Those are the kind of issues that are still playing on the minds of our people. And I was, in 1973, I went to Libya. I was invited by President Gaddafi as part of the International Youth Conference. And there, Gaddafi, Gaddafi, you know, those days was a hero for all of us Muslim lead, youth leaders. He was very anti-American, anti-West, and was seen as a hero for the Muslim world. And he basically, the message with the Green Book is that the West is decadent, communism will collapse, so Islam is the answer to the world's woes. But fortunately, we rejected that either because we believe in inclusivity. We did not want exclusivity. So inclusivity has been the guiding principle for me personally, with the experience of racial riots, with the experience I see in Singapore, we felt we must go the inclusive way. But with the changes, with the, the developments in the world today, whether it's in Malaysia, Indonesia, or the Muslim world, will that have an impact on the Muslims in Singapore? I'm sure it will. And that's why it's work in progress. And in fact, that is why I believe that contrary to the fact that the, the, the geography or the world developments affecting us, I think all the more, Singapore must make conscious efforts to make sure that we become more Singaporean. And I believe we are quite lucky, actually, we have Chinese as a majority. They are less inf uh, dogmatic, dogmatic about religion, although there are some concerns about more and more Chinese are becoming Christians, and that will have an impact in terms of race, uh, religious relation with the Muslims and Christians. But I think, generally speaking, Chinese are more open, as you can see from the survey results. They are more open to being more Singaporean and um, combining both ethnic and Singaporean values as one uh, common value for all Singaporeans. But how do we see ourselves 20 years later? Another example, when I was a youth leader, we formed the Pasatuan Mahasua Islam Asa Tangara, Association of Muslim Professionals Association of Muslim Undergraduates in South Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Singapore, basically. Anwar Ibrahim was in Kuala Lumpur, I was in Singapore, and Nokholis Majid in Jakarta. But that organization died a natural death because Indonesia was pushing secular sasi. That's the beauty about Indonesia, the largest Muslim country in the world, but they went more for syncretic approach to religion, and they were pushing for secularism, which Malaysia could not accept, and the whole organization died just like that. Those were the challenges we faced. Being Malay, being Muslim, how do you rise up to these challenges of the changing world? 
the changing geography, changing uh, what's happening in our region. So 20 years later, at first I wanted to say 30 years later, but I think I'm 70 now, 30 years too, too long away. <laughs> but uh, at least 20, not so bad, with a new guideline about Prime Minister Tun Mahathir being Prime Minister at 92, so there's still hope of living up to 90s. <laughs> but what will happen to our Singapore? Will be we become more Singaporean? It's a work in progress, a lot's happening in the world and in the region, and we cannot take things for granted. And all the more, and I would like to say that all the more Malays themselves, because of the nature, the special nature of their position in the region, Malay, predominantly Malay area, Malaysia, Indonesia, I think all the more Malays must make the effort to show that we are, in fact, Singaporeans. And I am very confident, I'm positive about it because I see a lot of changes, a lot of uh, positive developments amongst the Malays themselves to be more open, to be more accepting, and I'm confident that we will indeed become more Singaporean in the future. Thank you. Allow me to firstly thank all the speakers for their wonderful insights and perspective. They're just reminding me about the time. <laughs> Um, I would really um, want to convey my gratitude because I think we've been given a lot of um, um, historical background and also um, insights as to why um, the race conscious model and race conscious approach approaches are important for our community but there's caution of, of how we should not be too dependent on this and how we need to involve um, given the current dynamics um, so given that I think um, we have uh, some bit of background and some bit of insights I'd like to first start opening to the floor now questions um, for the speakers today because I know that we we don't have that much time so would anyone like to raise their questions is there anyone who already has a burning question they would like answered? If not, let me just start maybe to get the speakers to share a little bit more because they also were given very limited time. Um, you know, it was very interesting for me that um, we uh, were given um, a very detailed analysis of how things have evolved over time with the reflections of uh, our ambassador as well as um, the um, you know, questions raised by um, um, Prof Tan about the, why we are now navel-gazing and the caution given um, by um, Mr. Pereira or Dr. Pereira about how we may be overdoing it. Um, my question is this, I think we know that um, there is that um, need to um, have somewhat of a um, model, a classification model to allow for us to meaningfully um, ensure that um, we are conscious, we recognise and respect the different racial groups in Singapore, the different ethnicities in Singapore. Uh, but there is now a need to change and tweak it. I think, um, Prof Tan, you, you mentioned that um, their policies will uh, we're, we're being very racially conscious. The point is to be racially blind at the end of the day. I mean, we need to make some changes. Uh, perhaps you could elaborate a little bit um, and maybe the others could add on about what are the specific examples um, that we have um, that we could work towards tweaking and changing so that um, we work towards the environment where we're a bit more racially blind and less conscious, more respectful and more aware of each other? Thank you, Madam Mad Rayu. Um, so I think the... My sense is, you know, when I speak to young people is that, you know, there might be a collective uh, amnesia uh, about the genesis of Singapore, if I can put it that way. Um, so when you ask young people about, you know, the special position of the Malays, um, many don't even know about it, right? Um, so if the, que the, the question was, you know, what can be done? I think we need to constantly uh, be mindful of, um, you know, who we are and, and, and how we came about. Uh, because I, I think that to me is, uh, you know, the, the, the racial contract, if I can put it that way, right? That this was how Singapore came into being. Um, and it's something that, that we need to be, uh, you know, to be, to be mindful of. Um, you know, because there the, are the questions about, you know, oh, why should there be preferences, uh, you know, for the Malay community? Um, you know, why do they have this uh, you know, tuition fee grant? You know, why is it that they are allocated land 
uh, in public housing estates, you know, for their, for their mosques. Uh, so it's, it's, I think, something that, that, that we need, um, you know, to, uh, to, to bear in mind, um, you know, as we, as we, you know, strengthen our, our national identity, because you can't really strengthen a national identity if you don't really know where you came from. Uh, and that's why I ended my presentation by talking about you know, who are we, right? You know, because we, we have always talked about, you know, Chinese Singapore, Malay, Malay, Chinese Singaporean, Malay Singaporean, Indian Singaporean, uh, but really, you know, who, who are we um, as Singaporeans? Uh, I think that, that for me would be one that, that I think we, we should try to, uh, you know, to, to be mindful of. Can I have my slides? I'm going to show you something. <laughs> Can you trigger my slide? So I, I'm not very bright. I'm not sure I understood uh, Chairperson's question. But was she asking uh, how should the state not over, over recognize? Jillian, was that roughly what she asked? Uh, anyway, I'll say what I want to say. That's why I do all the time. Anyway. <laughs> this is a form. You know I love forms. <laughs> This is a form application for uh, special driving licenses, you know, heavy vehicles, buses, uh, public transport. Why must fill in race? No, 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 really, think it through. Think it through. Why must an application for a driving license, special driving, ask for what's your race? Why? Is it going to make any difference? What are you collecting? Why are you collecting? The, our answer, sorry, their answer will be always, we just collect. Maybe we do analysis later, but just collect. Because everybody also collect what? But collect for what? Some jobs don't collect. Maybe I should clarify the question. Um, you know, being in, um, um, now that I'm more aware, uh, now on the other side, right, um, it's always easy to talk about changing something, right, tweaking it. But the reality is it's not that easy. You can't just take away TTFS. Um, you know, the um, ethnic integration program we have, had, had, we have at HDB blocks, it has worked to some extent. Do we just scrap it? Um, and I accept that we may, in certain instances, you know, unnecessarily focus too much in news reports, for example. A 52-year-old Indian man got into an accident. Does it matter that he's Indian, that he's got into an accident, right? So things where race shouldn't matter, maybe we shouldn't emphasize it. But there are, in other instances, some important um, um, instances where for collations in medical records, right, that becomes relevant because it may help in some assessment for some support because we do have some racially, um, uh, you know, different racial groups supporting the different communities in Singapore. I don't know what the right answer is. Maybe someone who was in government <laughs> before could give a bit more insight about policies. I don't know about being in government before. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, uh, I mean, earlier on, Pereira asked whether people are becoming too sensitive about uh, many of the issues related to ethnicity, being minority. But I don't know whether Pereira is not becoming sensitive to that, oversensitive to that. <laughs> <laughs> we are in a digital era. We collect all kinds of information. But you know, you would be surprised how that, that categorization of race or religion sometimes can be very, very critical in certain situations, in death, Sometimes, you know, whether you, how you treat, for example, an accident case, whether it's a Muslim or non-Muslim. You know, I've handled cases of suicide, of mixed marriages, and I find that, you know, it's so complex an issue that it's important we know the background of the family. I, I know it's too much detail to go into now, but I've gone through a lot of such cases where it's so complex, and I was so happy that our mufti was so enlightened and so open-minded that we are able to tackle certain situations about mixed marriages, about inter religion, about conversion, and about needs, uh, religious needs when it comes to certain emergency situation. So information is important. But I'd like to go back to Eugene's point about whether we have educated our people enough 
about certain of the certain issues. For example, like the position of the Malays. For example, like uh, allocation of land for mosques. I know at one time, in fact, uh, all the other religious religion, religious groups had to tender for land in housing estates for churches, for temples, for mosques, uh, for temples uh, and churches, Chinese temples and Hindu temples. But mosques, they were allocated land. At first, they were allocated land, but later on, the Muslims have to pay a market price when the others have to still pay for tender prices. They have to compete for tender prices, but the time will come where Muslims themselves, having met, met the minimum requirements of the mosque, it is an housing state, will also have to tender. Similarly, for example, the fees, school fees, uh, free school fees up to tertiary level. This is unique, sing uniquely Singapore. I remember when Mr. Mr. Go Chok Tong was Prime Minister, he wanted to change the policy. He said, you know, you all must realize that there are a lot of Malays who need help, yes, but there are even a lot more Chinese belonging to the um, low-income group that need a lot more help. And they are questioning the question whether the government is actually spoiling <coughs> the Malays. So then they changed the policy. They had introduced a, sy a system where, in fact, if you're earning more than $3,000, I think, uh, in family income, then you don't automatically qualify for the free fees anymore. Then we had to bargain with the government say, OK, we can understand that. But on the condition, you, whatever you save, goes to the community. So this is, is an example of how we are pragmatic in the way we handle some of these positions in, uh, in our society. So I think a lot of things are not shared, I mean, not understood. Maybe, maybe it's too sensitive to be shared in public at that time. But I think there's room for education, whether about malls, about special position or education, or many other areas where there can be room for better understanding and better acceptance of such needs, unique needs of Singapore. There's one question I see. <coughs> Me? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, good morning. I'm uh, Lim Sui Kim from Fencing Singapore. Um, I'd like to share a little bit and also to pose this huge challenge we have. Um, personally, I, my name is Lim Sui Kim, so it's a Chinese family, but my own family has a mixture of Chinese, Indian, Malay, everything also champo like rojak lah. Okay. <clears throat> um, and I'd just like to, to bring one of the challenge that we face in the society. Serving in Fencing Singapore, I realized that uh, when we were planning for our young people to represent us in the Olympics, there were a lot of considerations. But uh, the racial issue for me came up again because I also wanted to make sure that our list of potential candidates whom we are going to sponsor using our uh, money from the government is adequately representing the people of our nation. Um, and I just want to say that uh, one of the challenges we face looking at what's happening down to the, um, I forgot, the young footballer, um, what's his name? Ben Davis. Ah, Ben Davis. Okay, so Ben Davis is, uh, has foreign parents, yeah? And um, he's a very young man. And I think one of the things that I found is that can we consider more flexibility, particularly from MINDEF? Yeah? We have other ministries who are working on very challenging situations, but in terms of MINDEF, I know it's very difficult because Singapore is multiracial. We're surrounded by countries which are different from us in a way, and we have to be very strict with our rules. But I think about um, like Korea. Yeah, my daughter is a Korean fan. And for South Koreans, the young boys, I think they have a range of age that they can go and serve in the national service. So just some thoughts of how do we give more flexibility and room for our society to, I suppose, think of more options, but yet, of course, still maintain our direction towards being you know, a leader in our region, etc., etc. Yeah, what, what do you think as a society that uh, we can consider? Because like when we talk about you know, Malay, Indian, Chinese, I also feel it's a bit backdated because I'm from a very mixed family, right? So I, I don't know whether if we are Sarani, where do we belong? So we talk about the new president. We have uh, 
Puan Halima, who graciously attended our recent uh, homecoming event in Bukit Timah at NUS. And, you know, the next one should be a Eurasian, right? Then how? how what are we going to do? These are very difficult questions. Can you lend us some insight on your thoughts? I don't think we're looking for answers <laughs> because everyone here is uh, mature, right? We are open-minded. Yeah. Thank you, Miss Lim. Thank you. Maybe you can ask Dr. Pereira if he's running. Huh? <laughs> Um, I would suggest this, given that we have a little of um, difficulty with time, may I take a few questions together? I, I noticed there's already one gentleman standing there, and then two more questions before I let the panel answer. Uh, perhaps, sir, your name and uh, where you're from? I'm a very simple before I ask the question. Uh, if you look at our calendar, um, just for the religious festival and our holiday, so I was told it's uh, two for each race. So the, the issue is that um, if, let's say, uh, Hi, um, my name is Elvin, um, and I run a private Peranakan home museum called the Intan. Um, there's a lot of interest in Peranakan culture, unlike um, Mr. Pereira, where it is uh, others, uh, Peranakan Chinese is classified as Chinese. I have a situation where schools and people's associations have always asked me to help out with the Peranakan uh, representation, but at the same time, um, we have cases where we are cannot be represented because we are not a CIMO. So, so, are, so I'm confused and I wonder what the, 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 the panel has uh, an opinion on this. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'm John. Um, I have a few comments, so take it or leave it is all right with me. <laughs> Ambassador, please keep telling the stories. They're very important to the younger ones because they actually do not know our history at all. Okay, so please do that again and again, over and over again. Um, I'm always worried about this term being banter around called tweaking. 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 Yeah. Uh, I think it's overused in Singapore until it doesn't really mean what it's meant to mean, I think. Uh, tweaking. Tweaking, you know, tweaking our policy, tweaking our plans and uh, programs. Yeah? Um, I'm very interested in the study by Matthew Matthews, but he's only, if I'm not mistaken, he's only given it a vignette of what is now. The four clusters as of now. My interest would be what his group, what would happen if his group go back to, say, 200 years ago. Okay, 199 years ago, 1819 when Stanford founded this place. I don't know who lost it, but there are certain juncture who were interested to us, I think. 1819, 1819 to 1950, 1950 to, say, 63, 65, and 65 to now. I think the four clusters will probably change dramatically over these four junctions. Huh? So that's my interest in that picture. The reason I'm saying is because uh, statistician tell you to remember three very easy facts if you want to read phenomena and trends that happened over a long time. The first fact is that in the last 50 years, mortality rate of infants has gone from 20 million to 6 million a year. That's a dramatic change. Huh? Uh, second fact is that fertility rate in the last 50 years has halved. So it's the growth of population of the world, also gone half. Uh, third fact is that, uh, now this one goes back a bit uh, longer. 200 years ago, 9 out of 10 people are in immense poverty. Uh, from 1950 to now, the number has gone to less than 1 in 10. Uh, the last 25 years, Every year, 137,000 people has gone from immense poverty to 
Not so poverty. So these are the facts that trace trends and phenomena, right? So I'd like to see the storyline of our multiracial thing over 200 years span. Um, now, I think if you want to talk about uh, Singapore identity, it, it's not only work in progress. The last 50 years, it has gone through a major, major climb. Uh, if you, because I belong to a certain group, Czech group, and what comes very clearly during GE14 is that the Singaporeans are so different from Malaysian. Just because the idea of Malaysia, a uh, Malaysian Malaysia or Malay Malaysia. So the divergence is immense. You can really see the differences now. And there are a lot of Malaysian actually who are Singaporean now. And we can see both sides. Uh, the Malaysian see one way, the Singaporean see another way. We are the ones that in between can slightly appreciate both sides a little bit. Thank you. Thank you for your question, sir. Maybe we take this one last one and yes. Please proceed. We Thank you very much for the questions. Um, we are um, running a little late uh, because we do have other panel sessions later. So perhaps this could be the opportunity for all the uh, panelists to actually answer the different questions that have been raised. And I saw close um, the session. I'm really sorry about that, but I think we, we don't have that much time. Perhaps, um, Dr. Pereira, would you like to go first? Uh, yes, I would love, um, on, I'm only qualified to answer one question and that is the one on the public holidays. I support more public holidays. For what reason? I don't care. But more public holidays, please. Uh, okay, from today onwards, we will declare IPS uh, event as public holiday. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, the, even if, on, when it comes to public holidays, it was an issue at one time actually. And, and Muslims have to cut down, and then we have a more balance. But anyway, um, quite a number of issues, and it shows, I'm very happy to see that, that the interests and the concerns uh, which uh, you have raised, I see uh, quite an over-representation of Eurasians, I think, from the questions. <laughs> <laughs> but on the tweaking, I think that's one, again, one of the unique stories about Singapore. We have actually tweaked, if you like, or changed or amend from the constitution to the uh, administrative policies to the grassroots policies, grassroots organization. I can see that these are three levels where they are very much involved about inter-ethnic relations, whether it's about the EP, whether it's about the GRC, whether it's about the quota on public housing, and also about the inter- uh, racial circles, which I think all points to the fact that this is a still work in progress. We have made a lot of progress, yes, but I think there's still a lot more need to be done because as we succeeding generations, the challenges will grow. And the final point about how to um, acculturate uh, non-Singapore, actually Singaporeans are still a lot more in the majority. I think it's, right now it's actually um, Two-thirds Singaporean wanted non-Singaporeans. And you remember the policy on population? We became a big controversy in Singapore because we were moving towards 50-50, like uh, in some countries. Like in the Middle East, it's even worse. It's 75%, 25% the other way around. 75% non-citizen and 25% or less for citizen. But in Singapore, I think we are trying to check that. It's now a one-third and two-third wanted non-Singaporeans, but the challenge is still there. We need to ensure that those who believe in Singapore must also understand what being Singapore is about. And just the same Singaporeans must also understand the dynamics of a more global, cosmopolitan Singapore society. And they are changing, and we need to really address those issues. Thank you. Uh, uh, just uh, two, two quick points. Um, I think one is, you know, when, when you live in a multiracial society, uh, it is dangerous to play a, a numbers game. Um, 
so this is respond to que the question about um, you know public holidays, for example, right? Every race, if they're equal, they should get the same number. Um, I, I think when we look at at, at the, the the governance that's been in place, you know, we it is important not to keep a balance sheet, um, you know, because if, if that were the case, right, then the majority Chinese, you know, would probably feel quite hard done, uh, you know, in, in in many different aspects, um, you know. So so we need to you know, to, to maintain, you know, that sense of balance as well as, you know, that sense of equity. Uh, I, I think in, in, in matters of race, you know, because I, I look at ethnic conflict regulation, uh, counting hates, you know, counting what each group gets will, will get us on a very uh, slippery path. Um, the, my, my, my second point is, uh, you know, in, re in response to Sui Kim's, uh, I know it was more a commentary, right? Uh, but she mentioned about, oh, you know, when, I don't know if she's, I hope, I hope I got it correct. Talk about when selecting fences for major games, you know, um, you know the, 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 the association tries to uh, have a, a selection that is re representative of Singapore. And I think this is where we need to be very, very careful. Right? This is where multiracialism intersects with meritocracy. Uh, and we don't want a situation where you have reverse discrimination, right? Because Oh, we need to show that we are multiracial, you know. So let's put aside meritocracy and let's have, uh, you know, let's bring in athletes who may not actually qualify, uh, you know, if race wasn't taken into account. So we need that that very delicate balance, right? You know, so so some of you may recall I was very much against, you know, the idea of, um, you know, the the the, the, the reserving uh, terms for the elected president. But I thought the Constitutional Commission did a, did a very good job, right? So the idea was, you know, when you have these two competing goods, right, meritocracy and multiracialism, right, there comes a point where one may have to take priority over the other. And so structuring it such that, you know, if 30 years pass and you don't have uh, a president from a particular race, you know, then the reserve election kick, kick, kicks in, um, you know, I, I, think, I think, you know, that's a good, uh, good measure to take. Uh, but I still hope that, you know, last year's presidential election you know, would be the first and last uh, reserve election. Thank you very much, speakers. Um, this has really been a very short and brief um, question and answer session, but I hope with the questions that you've raised and some of the insights that have been given by the panellists, it puts you in good stead to follow through with the rest of the day. You know, personally for me, it is, um, at the end of the day, constant work in progress. And it is our conversations, our efforts as individuals here today who care about the community, um, who care about uh, ethnic um, you know, integration and diversity in Singapore, to take that effort. So um, uh, please uh, join me in thanking the speakers today for their contribution and have a great session ahead. Thank you.